Thanks for everyone for showing up. And uh, it's great to be here. Fun to give a talk as always. All right, consider the following data structure. It's, a, it's, a, it's an expandable array. I, all of you have seen, this, seen something like this. It has a length field. It tells how long it is. It tells the next field where you put the next element. And it's got an array of values. And you see them pointing off here to the red and blue guys. Here, if you want to append uh, 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 this, this green object to the array, what do you do? Well, standard thing. Find out where to put it. First of all, you figure out if I need to expand it or not. Here, you don't. Figure out where to put it. Put it there. Bump the next pointer. No problem. What if you want to do two things in parallel? What if you want to insert the green guy and the pink guy in parallel? Well, here's what you do. You go down. Now, at this point, both of them believe they can put, both the, both the pens believe they can put their object into the, second, into the element number two of the array. What is this? It's called a data race because they're doing unsynchronized conflicting accesses to the same piece of memory. What could happen? Well, the green guy could go in, then the orange guy, then the pink guy could go in, and you lose the green guy. Okay? So now, I understand that many people here may not be completely familiar with this concept of data race. So what I've done is I've prepared a, quest, a list of questions and answers that may help you guys understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, what is a data race, first of all? Well, it's concurrent conflicting accesses to share data. Write, write, read, write access. Without synchronization. Now, what do people think about data races? They think they are evil. You want to see Hans's paper in the communications of the ACM, where he will tell you that they are evil. And in fact, he's even going to tell us again here today. Isn't that right, Hans? <laughs> exactly. Okay, so now, is Hans and the rest of his ilk correct? Are they right about this? And the answer is, of course not. <laughs> no, because data races are simply some internal phenomenon of mechanics of the program. The absence of the data races doesn't guarantee anything good is going to happen. If you have data races, it doesn't guarantee anything bad is going to happen. So why do people think they're evil? Well, they think they're evil because once upon a time when they were a young programmer, they forgot to make some synchronization. <laughs> and they didn't ha like what happened. So. If you go out on a hike and you're bit by a snake and you don't like what's happening, what do you say? <laughs> you say, hiking is bad. Hiking is evil for you. If you hike, you're going to get bit by a snake. I think everybody realizes that this is fallacious reason. And, but it's the same reason people use to condemn data races. OK, so now, this may come no, so, 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 so obviously, there's some kind of controversy here. And it's never clear who's right. So why don't you just say, look. I'm going to steer clear of this whole thing. I'm going to use synchronization. I'm going to be safe. Well, what's the downside? Well, performance overhead. Excess serialization. Deadlock. Lack of modularity from the nested monitor problem. Global failure propagation. Big problem with locks. This is probably the biggest problem with mutual exclusion synchronization using locks. Is you hold a lock, you fail in the middle, and the whole system grinds to a halt because nobody else can proceed. So I'm going to propose a new view of data structures. I'm going to say data structures have consistency properties. If an interaction violates a consistency property that the program needs, I'm going to call it a semantic data race. Okay? And I'm going to claim that this is a new and more useful concept because it's directly relevant to the semantics of the program, not to some potentially irrelevant internal detail of the execution that may or may not make it out to have actually affected anything. Now, the great thing about this new view is that it enables you to get past this dogma that some internal mechanism is always bad and enables you to consider the semantics of the program in broader context and come up with a much broader range of data structures. Okay, so now, okay, so let's take a look at this. What are the uh, expandable array consistency properties? Well, here's, some here's a bunch of nat natural properties. The first one is P1. The next pointer's got to be uh, before the length pointer. The next, the, the one after that is everything before the next pointer has to be not null. Everything after the next pointer has to be null. And this is a history-sensitive property, OK? This is a key property, that, that one of the key properties that, that, that data race I showed you before violated. This says, if I've appended something, then it's in the data structure, OK? And we already see that, if you, that data races are going to violate, potentially, this property. OK, so now, let's go and take a look at an instructive data race. Let's do three appends at the same time. First guy goes all the way through. Next guy comes down. Inserts the orange guy, inserts the pink guy. Next guy comes down, inserts the orange guy. Finally, the last guy, the, 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 red, the, the, green, the green object comes through, overwrites 
the pink object and then bumps the next pointer back. Okay. So here we are. Here's the question. Which properties are preserved? Is P1 preserved? Yes. Is P2 preserved? Prefix before next is all null? You bet, right? I've got a, I've got a non-null prefix. So that's yes. Okay, now, is everything at the next pointer and after? No. No. So this property is not preserved. Does it preserve the history property? No, because the pink guy is nowhere to be seen and the orange guy is arguably not in the red. Okay, so now, this tells us what we can aspire to prove about this data structure and we can aspire not to prove. P1 and P2, we can still aspire to prove. P3 and P4, we can't prove them if we've got a correct proof, sound proof methodology because they're not held by this, by this, by this uh, unsynchronized data structure. Now, can we prove that P1 and P2 are preserved? And yes, by a very simple methodology, we just consider every right. So here's the right to A that expands the array. Uh, I'm going to tell you that the expand operation produces an array that satisfies P1 and P2. And also, it preserves the initial prefix of the old array that happens to be non-nil. So if you expand, for example, this array here, you're going to get all of these guys copied out into the expanded array, even though the next pointer happens to point here. This is, this is important, by the way, for proving uh, P1 and P2 for some of the other properties. So yeah. you assume that expand is a magic thing that happens atomically here? No, no, no. no. I, I, I'm not assuming that it's a magic thing that happens atomically. It is a, 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 an operation whose code I'm not going to show you, but, I, but, but what, it, what it does is it goes in, creates a new version, copies out the thing after the first prefix. Well, I mean, is that? It doesn't have to happen atomically. In fact, it doesn't because it's reading the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the old version, which may be concurrently under update by a bunch of other guys. OK, that's my concern. And that's going to be OK. Yeah, sure, no problem. Okay. Yeah, no. So it depends, of course, on what the API for this thing is. If there's a remove operation, why not? Because if it's during during that data copy, um, somebody could have nulled out the slot. Could what? Could have nulled out the slot. Which slot? One of the ones being copied. Oh, then you have to do a data structure repair operation. But that's another story. I'm not going to get into that right now. Yeah. yeah. So um, since Hans hasn't said it, so you have a different definition of data race than Hans has for at least that I thought. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe I'm using the standard definition of data race. Right. I mean, it may be that people have come up with uh, more definitions later yeah, on. But the, you know. the, the difference is that uh, in the languages, if you flag the thing as this is an atomic variable, then the array is an automatic variable by your definition of it. If you haven't so flagged it, then uh, violation three can mess you up. So you know, I see. So if I declare every variable to be atomic, I have no data race. That's right. No such thing. Yeah, you didn't. That's right. So, OK, but that seems to be a particularly sterile definition of data races because it doesn't address the problem we got about data race in the first place. It's actually a very productive one. You go all the stuff you're talking about in the languages. Ah, so what you're saying is, <laughs> this is great. So what you're saying is, OK, so basically, you're just playing semantic word games with your audience. Because the key thing that people hate about well, data races, one, one of the no, no, is this, playing some games. I'll, I'll argue with you instead of me, but go ahead. OK, so. <laughs> You have a limited amount of time, yep. including Q and A. Deal with it how you want. Feel free to say we'll hit, hit that in discussion if you want to. Um, okay, so I told you I'll, 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 talk, I'll talk about what I think is important here. Maybe I'll skip some stuff, but then I'll address that issue because I think it's important. Okay. Okay, so now we can prove that these things are preserved. Um, I'm not going to worry too much about it. Going. Okay, so now we have a synchronization-free data structure that preserves P1 and P2. Are P1 and P2 enough? It's going to depend on the client. Okay. There's two things I care about: integrity. Does the program crash? And accuracy, does the program produce an accurate internet result often enough? So let's talk about typical use cases for integrity. Let's say the client traverses the array until the a.next thing. And it's assuming it's going to get non-null things. So all, all it really cares about is P1 and P2. OK? So this is fine. But maybe the client needs P3 as well. Well, in this case, what you can do is you can apply the following data structure repair algorithm. You can go in, bump the next pointer up to the first non-null guy, and then clear it out after that. Okay? And re you can restore P3. So there's two ways of doing of, of attacking this problem. One is saying, I identify the properties my client needs, and I make sure that my unsynchronized accesses satisfy the property. Or 
identify a weaker set of properties that the unsynchronized access is preserved, but then from a data structure that satisfies those weaker properties, I can always do a repair operation that gives the client the properties that it needs. Okay? And now what about accuracy? Well, you know, this is so 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 here the client uses an intermediate data structure, like it's a task queue to collect values for some sort of reduce operation, this kind of thing. In many cases, the values are redundant. Uh, we've done a bunch of research that shows in a bunch of programs you don't have to execute all the tasks and you'll be fine. So if you happen to lose stuff out of the task queue, it's not a problem. Or you don't only need a close enough approximation to the reduction. Again, a bunch of programs have this property, we're okay. So and if you don't drop too many appended objects, the expandable array is accurate enough, you don't have a problem. Okay. Let's take a, a, a look at another instructive case here. Okay? Here I've got a full array. I come down. I decide, okay, I've got to expand the array, so I'm sort of expanding the array. In the meantime, another guy comes in and says, okay, I've got to expand the array, so I'm expanding the array too. First guy expands the array, flips the pointer, puts his version in, life's great. Next guy expands the array, flips the pointer, comes in, his version's okay. Do we have an integrity problem? No. Nope. Do we have an accuracy problem? Depends. Maybe the client needs it, maybe it doesn't. Let's say we have an accuracy problem. Is there something we can do here to address the accuracy problem? Well, let's think about the accuracy problem a little bit. Okay? There's a window of vulnerability here. What's a window of vulnerability? Here's what the pattern looks like. Okay, you check a condition, you based on the check, you select what update you're gonna do. It then takes you some time to prepare the update. Once you've prepared the update, you go off and you do it. So the window of vulnerability goes from the check to the install. Okay, because there's this huge time here where somebody can come in and mess with the data structure. And, and invalidate the reason that you thought you were doing it. So how do, you, how do you make this window of vulnerability smaller? What you do is you do a final check, okay? You do a final check that be, before you actually do the install, you prepare it, you check to see if the condition is still valid. If it is, great, go ahead and install the update, otherwise retry, okay? So this is a way to make your window of vulnerability smaller, yeah? Is it assuming some inconsistency? Would it still be correct? So what? Is it, since, since you're allowed data races, then is, what if, is, are you assuming sequential consistency? Okay, so, so, consistency? okay, great question. So here's the question. How do you reason about these kind of things? What I do is I always reason about it using sequential consistency. Okay, I figure the machine's close enough anyway, I'll learn as much <laughs> if there's a problem to show up. The machine and the language. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, sometimes you get, that's right, sometimes you gotta look at the compiled output. Okay, but, Another way to do this is to, use, is to reason about it using sequential consistency, then you can go off and find all these papers that prove that if your program is in a certain form and you prove it's correct using sequential consistency, then it's correct for all these other kinds of consistency too. Okay? So you can sometimes do that. Okay? All right, so what happens here? Now, with a final check. First guy materializes, comes in. Does the final check succeed? Yes, because his local copy C points to A. So he goes ahead, does the install, life's great. Second guy comes in, his, his, his update's prepared, does the final check. Does the final check succeed? Well, C points to something different, so it points to the old value, not the copied value. So comes in, you do the retry, and now the final check succeeds, and you get both elements there. Now, here's the question. Does this always eliminate this problem? No. Why not? Because you might, you, you might look and see also the road, you just have to use the reset. That's right. So this is an accuracy enhancing mechanism. It is not something that guarantees you perfect accuracy. I called it a mitigation mechanism a year ago. Okay, cool. Great, sounds good. But what are you mitigating? The error, the probability of error, the frequency of error. Uh, no errors here, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I just made one. <laughs> if you don't know the program, you don't know if there's an error. That's right. All right, so what are the basic concepts here? Um, Okay, integrity, here's what we do. Determine the properties that the client needs, use minimal, ideally no synchronization to ensure that the operation is due to the properties or that you can get back to them by restoring the properties by, by data structure repair. Accuracy, determine the proper accuracy properties you need. Uh, the way we evaluate accuracy right now is we just run the program and see if it's accurate or not. Do it enough times that we get a, good, we get a good, good, good handle on it. Find any windows of vulnerability, if necessary, enhance accuracy with final checks. Okay, now, why do we do integrity by reasoning statically about the program, and accuracy by doing empirical runs. Well, because it's easier to reason about this than it is about this. If it's easier to do this using, using runs, and this using static analysis, we'll do that too, okay? All we're interested in is a program that's accurate enough 
off and on. Okay, so thinking about data races, it's important here that you take an end-to-end -end approach, okay? Get an application with a data race, understand the local impact, and evaluate end-to-end -end effect. So here's, here's what we're gonna do, the barn side and body simulation. The simulation proceeds as follows. You compute the force acting on each body from all other bodies. Conceptually, it's an n squared problem. Use the forces to move the bodies and then repeat. He, uh, there's, there's a key data structure people use to organize this computation to make it run faster. It's called the space subdivision tree. Conceptually, you chop your space up into quadrants and then have separate lists for each body in each quadrant. It turns out that people don't like to have a lot of bodies there, so what they do is they recursively subdivide the tree until they get enough bodies in each body. Okay. Why? Okay, so you have internal nodes. Um, the internal node is going to contain the center of mass for the subtree. Why is this useful? Because we're going to use a center of a mass approximation for distant bodies. Let's say I want to compute the force acting on this brown body here. Instead of going off and laboriously computing the force from the blue, orange, red, pink, green, and blue, I just use, I just approximate the effect of all these bodies with the center of mass of that internal node. It takes the n squared algorithm into an n log n algorithm. All right, so how does the algorithm work? Build the space subdivision tree, compute the forces, move the bodies, repeat. How do you build the tree? Well, here's a partially constructed tree. What you do is you drop bodies down the tree like that until they find their place. Drop another body, what's going to happen now? Split. I'm going to split it. That's exactly right. Okay? Add internal nodes as necessary. And put the guy there. Okay, now let's say I do an unsynchronized parallel tree construction. What might happen? I drop three guys down here. I might get that. I drop those two. I might get this guy. Drop those two. I might get this guy. Drop those two. Anything else can happen? It might work out perfectly. That yeah, could happen too, possible. right? I might split it. Both might show, one might show, the other might show. Okay? So what's the effect of this unsynchronized construction? I'm going to tell you, I always produce a tree that the force computation calculation can use. Okay? But the tree might not contain all the bodies. What's the effect? Well, the forces are computed as the bodies didn't exist for that simulation step. I get an approximate force calculation. But notice that I've already got an approximate force calculation because I'm using the center of mass approximation. Preserves integrity, uh, may affect the accuracy. Okay? So what if I don't drop bodies? What's my option? Add synchronization, use tree lock. Okay, sprinkle locks around, and you can see the bodies acquiring the locks and releasing as they go down. Okay, so now this eliminates the data races. But notice that you've got to do something to synchronize on the reads to eliminate the data races. Otherwise, you've got unprotected reads going against all these writes. Option number two: update lock. Again, I put locks everywhere, but I only acquire the lock if I'm actually going to do an update. Turns out that for this data structure. This doesn't eliminate data races, but eliminates all the semantic data races. You preserve the key properties one, two, th all the, pro the natural properties one, two, three, four. Okay. So now we've got three options: so unsynchronized. This is that final check. Yeah. You can do an unsynchronized pair, or you, if you kept any body for a very high plus, it'd be pretty easy to in parallel scan the whole list again. Yeah, you can do that. If, if that, that, that that's 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 an accuracy enhancement mechanism. Right. Exactly. Um, okay. So. We didn't do that. So we did, so we got unsynchronized, tree locking, update locking. Okay? We're gonna do we're gonna we're gonna implement them all and see how fast they run. Okay, tree locking. Slower than the sequential version of one processor, gets worse as you add processors. Okay. Update locking scales reasonably well, but not as good as unsynchronized and final check. And this for this thing, um, the final check doesn't add hardly any overhead. <coughs> Okay. How, do we accurate, how, how, do we, how do we evaluate the accuracy? Well, we need a comparison point. Full n squared too, too expensive, so we compare with a hyper accurate version that goes, uses the center of mass approximation, but goes lower in the tree before it applies, the, before it applies that approximation, so it's more accurate. This gives us an accuracy comparison point. So we need an accuracy metric. We start with two corresponding configurations from two different simulation algorithms, typically a reference one, typically the hyper accurate, and a comparison. We compute the sum of the distances between the corresponding bodies and the divide the sum by the distance boundary logs. So here is the key accuracy result. The distance between the hyperaccurate version, the accuracy metric between the hyperaccurate version and all other versions, running on all of the numbers of processors, is to three digits of precision 1.02%. Five minutes. Cool. Okay. So visually, the hyperaccurate version is over here. All these guys are clustered together. Two orders of magnitude difference. Okay. The effect of the final, the final check does have an effect on the accuracy, but we don't need it. Okay. Parallel. Parallel. Parallel data structure themes, make sure you get the integrity, make sure you get the accuracy, acceptable data structures can contain data races, general lessons, the concept of data races as it currently stands is a broken concept. 
Okay, what really matters are the semantic properties. You want to focus on these things. The result of this data, data race thing is the programs are over-synchronized and the synchronization is imposing bigger problems. Here's the bigger picture. Okay, synchronization-free data structures are only one approximate computing mechanism. We've developed a whole bunch of others. Aspiring to perfection is increasingly untenable because you've got huge systems and huge data sets. Uh, everything is, perfection is un unobtainable and undesirable. Now, the obsession that the field has with data races is only one manifestation of this damaging aspiration for perfection. It's time to move to a more mature and productive perspectives, approaches, and techniques for this. All right, I'm done. You, 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 you. Okay, so um, it doesn't help to, to just split the array down to a certain level to start with. You know, if you have a million objects, just make your tree go down a certain level. And yeah, yeah, we, we did it already. I think we constructed two levels of the tree deep, and we have like 10 bodies per okay. bin. So we already did that. And I think it's a standard thing in the field. Okay. So uh, I like this a lot because it, because the, the internals look like my day job that I do every day. Or, you know, because inside of things like that, which you just spoke I'm highly based home. Mm -hmm. Outside, I make promises to all those people in the world who are not highly raised tolerant. And this is, I think, the, the, the hardest issue is that for modular systems, we say this realm is race tolerant, and we export out to you with some API, something saying, don't worry or we'll head about it, we give you good happiness reports out. This is not very different than what Hans will talk about later, about saying that, you know, if you're race tolerant, just say you're race tolerant. Put in, if you're in C++11, say I'm, in, I'm relaxed at home. And, so, yeah. and, and so my, my, my complaint about this whole mission is not that I don't love all the techniques, it's that I don't know the software engineering story. How can I make APIs that have um, race tolerance as a free parameter? Okay, so the mistake in your thinking is that you're focusing on data races. You should instead focus on the properties. The story here is very simple. Uh, that's what I do. Well, then why is it called data race? What does race tolerant mean? Oh. We, shouldn't, we shouldn't have the concept of races in this so field. Maybe it should be accuracy. I use mode. that as an, as an abbreviation for the essence. I, we agree entirely. Okay. okay. So, oh, so let, well, again, let's come back to that as well as the semantic issue during the whole group discussion, if we could. Because yeah. these things seem like they need a little bit longer to and fro. Okay. I, and I, I want to ask you a quick question. Yeah. Why a linear uh, me measure of error rather than one with a second moment term in it? Your accuracy measure, you said it was something like the sum uh, why, why of the discrepancies the velocity and the distances. The yeah. Why didn't you do the sum of the squares of the errors? Oh, uh, error? because when I'm looking at, uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I could easily have done that. Okay. Oh, 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 you mean why didn't I, why didn't, why didn't I sum it? Why didn't I sum the squares? Yeah. I didn't like it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, th 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 there's all these different metrics you can use. And I think, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking at a picture, I think my perception of what the error is is more linear than square. Well, we can take that one offline, too. Yeah. But I mean, you know, people, you, I, you know it's, for me, it's kind of arbitrary. All, all these accuracy metrics are arbitrary. What really matters is your subjective interpretation of what happens. And, you know, there's some correlation here. And that's just the way I thought my subjective interpretation would work out best. Is there another question you wanted to do? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So the, the big message was that the accuracy you lost by the center of gravity approximation was so much larger than the accuracy you lost by the uh, by throwing away synchronization. Away synchronization that nobody can no complain. No one will care. Well, but nobody can reasonably complain. Yes, that's that's one of that's that's the big message from the experiment. That ran. Yeah. The other big yeah. message is it's it's somewhat faster with synchronization. The other the, the other message is that like that is. You cannot make, as far as I can tell, this particular tree construction algorithm run fast, uh, run, run data race fee free and fast at the same time. Okay, thanks, Mark. I guess I'm done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>